it's pretty brutal doing repair, touching expensive things, and then feeling like you might have somehow broken it. I want to talk to you today about something a little bit different. Yes, I'm using the cheapo action camera again. Yes. Yes, I'm dumb and I don't have a proper clip for my lavalier, so you're going to hear this scratchy nonsense too, I bet. <clears throat> but, here it goes. Let me tell you about two laptops. Two laptops that made me think that I was going to be on the hook for a lot of money. Here's the problem with computer repair, and one of the reasons that you need to be careful if you get into it and you don't know what you're doing, uh, and you get in a bit over your head. When you deal with other people's equipment, those people have spent money on that equipment. Sometimes they've spent a lot of money on that equipment. And two of the laptops that came through recently that I did some major surgery on were $1,000 plus units. One was an Asus gaming laptop, which I talked about in another video briefly. Another was a Samsung 2-in-1, um, which I just delivered recently. Um, I actually am just driving away from dropping that off with the customer and taking the rest of their money. I had to order the Samsung part um, from China for like $120. I just ordered it on eBay because, you know, screw it. But you have to get the whole, like, fused glass, blah, blah, blah. It was awful. So let's start with the Asus. I would like to start um, with the horror show that was this Asus gaming laptop manufactured in 2021. At least that's what the sticker said, manufacture date 2021. This Asus gaming laptop, I did not know about this before, but I found out with this one. And it was a really, really brutal, um, horrible introduction. I don't wish it on anyone. This lady comes in, her Asus gaming laptop is fine for a while, but then it'll overheat. It'll it'll turn off. She didn't say overheating, she wasn't sure. She blew the dust out, still was turning off in the middle of gaming. You know, play a certain game, I think it was uh, Pummel Party, for like 15-20 minutes, guaranteed to shut off. <clears throat> to the point that it was an actual problem for her um, not being able to game. Um, so, because she could not play one of the games she likes a lot on her gaming laptop, she figured it was time to probably take it to somebody with a little more experience that would rip it open and fix it. And so I do. I rip it open. And I get the surprise of my life. The thermal paste looks a little weird. And I don't find out until later that there's actually a new thermal paste that people are using called liquid metal. And by new, I don't mean like brand new. It's not apparently something that hasn't been heard of. It's been around for years. I just never run into it, never heard of it, never... It just never crossed my radar. But liquid metal, what is liquid metal? It is exactly what it sounds like. It's a combination of gallium with other metals like tin. It sort of resembles a solder that never hardens. If you ever solder and you have those flowing solder blobs, Imagine that the blobs never solidify, and that's basically what this liquid metal crap is like. Asus uses liquid metal since, I think, like 2019, maybe. <coughs> Asus uses liquid metal in between the CPU, GPU, and heatsink assemblies in all their gaming laptops instead of standard thermal paste. I... I favor a thermal paste called Arctic Silver 5. Other people like Arctic Silver MX5 or MX6 just recently came out. Or um, I mean, there's a ton of pastes. I'm not going to go over a list of them, but a lot of people favor a lot of different pastes. But liquid metal is literally metal. Most thermal paste is not electrically conductive, which means if you put thermal paste non-liquid metal, thermal paste somewhere it doesn't necessarily belong, there's no risk of it shorting out something. It's not going to make metal-to-metal -metal contact between two electrical parts that aren't supposed to have that happening. Liquid metal is a completely different beast. Liquid metal is literally metal. It is, it is liquid metal, and anywhere it goes, so does the electricity. 
and see one of the things that, that Asus and other manufacturers but not I think it really is just Asus one of the things that Asus pushes is that oh liquid metal works better than thermal paste and it's basically permanent right or at least it, that's kind of how they present it like oh we figured out an alloy for liquid metal that that's not doesn't need replacement and blah 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 well that's bullshit because what happened with this lady's computer is that if you can imagine the plate that sits on top of her CPU and the CPU itself, all that liquid metal, ideally if it was like thermal paste, it would just be in a flat layer and when you pull it up, I mean, it'll do what it does. When I pulled the heat sink up, instead of a layer of, you know, obviously flattened but pulled up thermal paste, what do I get? I get a ring of liquid metal. Now you might be going like, what do you mean a ring? On the square, see, like they, they put it in a circle? Yeah, and I didn't know it was liquid metal. Initially, what I thought is that it was some kind of bizarro thermal paste that I just hadn't seen before, and that this stuff had just been applied poorly. Like, why did you put thermal paste in a circle, avoiding the middle, on this CPU? Why is it in a circle around the center? It's just so weird. Because one of the other properties of thermal paste is that it doesn't move, it doesn't flow. Thermal paste is thick. Even the thin thermal pastes are not a liquid. They are chunky. They are, they have substance to them. They, they don't, they're like a colloid. Um, they don't, they just don't flow. They're not a, a fluid like that. <clears throat> so because thermal paste is not a fluid, but rather as a colloid and a uh, typically it, it's just not runny at all it can kind of hold it up its own structure to some extent it's like toothpaste it's a paste so this stuff I didn't know it wasn't thermal paste I saw a ring and I tried to figure out what the hell happened logically the only conclusion that you can reasonably come to is for some reason on both the CPU and GPU somehow the manufacturer put the stuff on in a ring and it didn't spread properly. Instead, it squeezed out at the edges. Or so it looked. Later, I figured it out because I noticed the liquid metal's properties. I read about it. And I realized that what really happened is, in a computer, you have expansion and contraction due to heat and cool. A processor and heat sink will warm up and will cool off. And it's not unusual, especially during gaming, for the processor to get very hot and the heat sink to get very hot and then the heat and cool fluctuates based on usage <coughs> and that makes me cough really badly but these fluctuations cause the board the CPU the heat sink every part that gets warmer expands and what I figured out is whenever these things expand they bow so they become more like an arc instead of just a flat and that means that the CPU would become a bowed object and to a lesser extent, the big chunky heat sink. And because of that, and because the heat, the hotter the liquid metal is, the more like a liquid, like more it flows readily. Well, these CPUs, these, uh, this, she had a Ryzen 5900HX, I believe it was. And CPUs like this, they get hot, boy. They, they, a mobile gaming CPU, it's not unusual for a mobile gaming chip to be in the 90s, 95 even, for these radio, or the uh, AMD Ryzen, I think it was a Ryzen 9 5900HX. Um, I mean, top of the line um, AMD laptop gaming CPU. It's not unusual for those chips to get very hot during gaming and stay that way. The breakdown isn't until like 105 Celsius anyway, so they can take it, you know, and they'll just throttle as needed. It, it's actually expected operation. Well, at 95 degrees Celsius, that liquid metal is looking more like water and less like paste. And it's flowing pretty freely. And the CPU and the board are pushing up in a dome sort of shape rather than being flat against the heat sink. So what happened is the liquid metal got pushed off the center of the die towards the edges. And as it got pushed more and more to the edges, eventually this liquid metal started to leak out. 
What I discovered in there was horrible. And it took me a long time to get it cleaned up. See, there's this silvery heat sink paste. Look at the look at the beautiful silvery heat sink paste. Except, where is it? There's heat sink paste around the edges. Why is there no heat sink paste in the middle? The liquid metal had pushed out from under the CPU and heat sink and onto the bypass capacitors on top of the CPU, shorting some of them. It had also pushed further than that. Um, there is an insulating layer that kind of helps with the physical reinforcement of the CPU against the heat sink. But two of the corners of this layer don't exist. It's, it's literally two L's like this with opening, just like this. Well, of course, that damned liquid metal can leak out of that. And, you know, you've got a gaming laptop that gets hot, probably sitting on this girl's lap and gets moved a lot. What do you think is going to happen? Well, I'll tell you what happened. The metal got out. The metal was touching things inside the computer, causing it to shut off. <clears throat> and uh, what I ultimately found that I think caused the failure, the random failure, other than potentially overheating, there was a blob of liquid metal that had managed to make it all the way over to an EEPROM, or at least it it was a, like a TS SOP chip. It was just one of those itty bitty um, chips with tiny legs. But three, three of those legs, if I recall correctly, had a liquid metal blob on top of them and thus were shorted together. And yeah, I, I basically spent like, I probably spent a week off and on fiddling with this thing um, once I figured out that it was the liquid metal that had done it and that it wasn't just overheating. Um, and removing this stuff is a bear. You use Q-tips and isopropyl alcohol to get it to kind of float and stick to the Q-tips. I say Q-tips, I mean cotton swabs. Q-tip is the brand name. I sometimes forget that I have international uh, viewers that may not know what a hell a Q-tip is. But you take your swab, you put alcohol on it, and you just start rolling around wherever you see a little potential stray piece of metal. And if it's liquid metal, it'll cause it to mobilize. And once that metal is rolling around on your pool of alcohol, you can move your swab in a certain way to kind of catch it and lift it up. You end up going through a lot of swabs this way, though. But that's what it took. And I found metal several inches away from the CPU and GPU. It Basically, that metal had infiltrated that board and it just, you know, a lot of places it just was. But some places it was touching electrical components and any one of those places could have potentially caused a problem. This poor girl is so lucky. Hold on just a second. Big turn, big turn. Um, this poor girl is so lucky because she could have had any number of component failures caused by this stupid metal leaking out. And she didn't. So I was able to successfully, I think, get all the liquid metal out, put Arctic Silver 5, damn it, Arctic Silver 5 normal heat sink paste on both the chips, put it all back together, oh my god, it works. But the problem is that when it came in, it worked, but it would shut off like she said. After I opened it initially and just sort of looked around and I kind of slapped it back together and wanted to check one more thing, it didn't turn on at all. And that was when fear set in. <clears throat> if you're working on someone's $1,700 gaming laptop, and I am not kidding you, this thing still sells for $1,700 today, and it works when it comes into you, and it doesn't work after you open it. There are a lot of explanations. I actually started probing VRMs and stuff before I figured out the liquid metal thing. You know, there's a lot of possibilities as to what could have blown, but to any normie looking into the tech trade. It worked when they brought it to you, it just had an issue. Now it's dead dead. Now the computer doesn't work at all, which implies that you messed it up. And I know it's not fair. People assume that tech guys, as soon as you touch it, you own it. 
anything that happened, it must be that you broke it. And I think with normal people doing normal things, that's a reasonable assumption. But with a, a seasoned tech person like me, it's not as reasonable reasonable of an assumption unless I'm just one of those people that managed to fail upwards. But how does she know that, right? So, um, the fear was put in me. When you're juggling someone's $1,700 computer and everything looks like you screwed it up, um, that's $1,700. I would have to do, you know, probably 17 to 20 repairs, depending on how much they were worth, to make that money back. That's like cleaning out multiple weeks worth of what I could do, depending on, you know, the busy of the season um, and right now it's slow so that wouldn't happen but yeah it one job one like you royally screwed up and have to buy them a new computer can easily clean out a month worth of um, a month worth of gain you know depending on the season so it it's pretty brutal doing repair touching expensive things and then feeling like you might have somehow broken it even though I knew that I hadn't done anything wrong, the fear's there anyway. And the fear is healthy, and it makes sense, not because I did break her computer, but because it looked like I broke her computer. And in a court of law, that's all that actually matters, is that it looks like you screwed it up. <clears throat> I don't have a drink. I'm sorry. I'm just going to have to cough a lot. You'll get over it. But anyway, that's number one. Then, today, I was working on number two, this, this Samsung 2-in-1, um, nice, shiny, thin, you know, fairly new, but the lady had dropped it um, in the past on a corner. The drop dinged the corner, dented the base, and there were scratches on the corner of the lid, but why wasn't the lid bent up? Well, the lid wasn't bent up because instead of bending the lid, it just cracked the glass. There was a nice, clean fracture about one third into the left side of this screen, the touch glass part. But she started having a problem where the screen would freak out. And in a way that I never got to see it, but the way that she described it, there's no way that a graphics chip was responsible for the freak out. It absolutely had to be that the screen was freaking out. Hang on, this is another bad turn. It had to be that the screen was freaking out um, because of a failure, some sort of probably a trace in the circuit board or the fine ribbon cables um, in the LCD being broken. <clears throat> All it takes is a tiny fracture in the wire an itty bitty fracture that upon some motion or you know even just a little thermal expansion caught the the contact breaks in that wire but then when it cools off it's fine or when you move it around it's fine and it's very hard to chase stuff like that down but by the description she had I think a column failure going on and that typically hoses everything to the right of that on the screen or if you've got a row failure, it can hose everything underneath it. This kind of depends on the screen. But anyway, um, the bottom line is that it was um, based on the symptom report. It was pretty clearly the LCD. And based on the fact that it had been dropped and was dented and scratched and had a giant crack, yeah, pretty sure. Pretty sure it's the LCD. It needs to be replaced. Yeah, touch, touch glass is cracked. You'll get new touch glass had to order the part from China because you have to get a fused glass assembly and it's put together like a MacBook where the LCD part and the diffuser light polarizer are separate so <coughs> it was the worst thing it was the worst case ever now here's the thing I don't think I've ever actually done a Mac style LCD repair in fact I'm pretty confident that I've never done one where the LCD wasn't a self-enclosed unit and then the glass was fused to the front of that. So this was new for me because the liquid crystal part was attached to the glass but the rest of the LCD was attached to the lid. 
and the wires going to this board for the touch screen and the LCD, this daughter board that came with it, were rigid and had no give to them at all. So the wires that ran to this thing, basically, um, it was almost impossible to get them to plug back in. I had to put a shirt under the screen on top of the keyboard and tape the polarizer up so it would stop falling out. Um, and then I had to kind of cock up the LCD glass assembly and get my big chunky man hands in there. And getting these connectors together is just a nightmare. It took me 45 minutes. But you best believe, 35 minutes in, even 40 minutes in, I was sitting there in that chair having tensed up so much trying to do fine motor skill work and failing and getting frustrated and angry. I was so tense that I was sweating bullets. I was hot, boy. Hot. And it was not fun. It was just awful. And once again, the fear set in. You have pried this old screen out. Some friggin' glass shards fell out of it as you were doing so, you just really just chewed it up because even though I have a heat gun, even though I have a hot air rework station, and thus was able to heat the adhesives and take the thing apart in a more elegant way than what these weird cards that came with the repair part told me to do, just pour alcohol on them, yeah, okay, bro, whatever. But even though I was able to heat the adhesives to peel them apart, the thing still gets trashed. I mean, it's already got a crack. Some chunks came out of it. It was it was a whole thing. So the old screen is toast. You're not putting it back in. <clears throat> and here you are with the new screen. And you can't even get the damn thing plugged up. And, you know, the adhesives don't match. So I had to take a utility knife and slice the adhesives that were provided into smaller um, cut, cut as needed strips to get this thing glued back in, so to speak. It was a nightmare, an absolute effing nightmare. And the worst part is you can't, you can't put this thing back together and test it. You have to put it back together and that's the end of it. And if you've screwed up, if this wire or the touch wire are not all the way in the socket, are not locked in place, are not making perfect contact, when you put that screen back, repairs failed and you'll have to now pry your new screen out, risking destroying a $120 part. You're not gonna get another deposit on that. That's gonna easily clean out the money that you make. So, yeah, it's scary. And you sit there thinking, holy shit, this laptop's worth $1,000. Thing's worth $1,000 and here I am, not able to finish this repair. You know, it's, it's so bad that I actually was worried that I may have damaged the new part. It really was that bad, guys. I, I can't even begin to explain the level of stress that some of this shit gives you. You think, oh God, you know, it's once it's in, you've committed. It's it's like you can't unwind this. And the wires were so hard to get attached properly that that combined with the one and you don't get another chance nature of it. It's just it's hell on your mind. You just. You cannot fathom. So anyway, I'm not going to keep talking in circles about that. But that's twice in the past week, week and a half, that I have handled, you know, four-digit price computers and was worried to death that I had hosed one. This field, okay, there's a lot of levels to it. Most people start out by getting a Windows disk or making a Windows bootable flash drive or hard drive and just wiping people's computers out, not saving their data because, you know, you don't think about that. And, oh, you lost all my pictures of my dead mom and my daughter that died in a car crash and stuff. Oh, oh well, sorry. And then you just never answer the phone again. And that's how a lot of people start. And that's also where a lot of people stop when somebody's like, where are my pictures? Oh shit. I might be in trouble. And that usually scares a lot of the normies out of it once they do something that ruins someone's computer or loses all their data. <clears throat> but anyway, look, users can lose their data on their own. They don't need your help, tech guy. But um, 
then you've got people who get further into it who understand things like drivers, who understand file systems and you know where things are stored, you know, that, that have some degree of knowledge, maybe do some hardware stuff like upgrade RAM, that's they've built a few of their own PCs. Just generally people who can do some things, but there's still a whole lot to learn before they can be a really really good general purpose PC technician. And then you've got the more advanced guys, which I would put myself in this category, where they've done a lot and seen a lot and handled a lot of edge cases, a lot of weird systems, a lot of odd design ideas or, you know, just seen enough and expanded and tried enough things and learned enough skills that they can fix the more obscure problems, the more difficult things. Things that require heat gun to disassemble, for example. You know, some of these uh, these motherboard reflows and that kind of thing. Really deep hardware repair stuff, you know. And once you get to that level, there's an, an element of hubris that inevitably sets in because you know what you know, but you also know what you don't know. And the problem is that the knowing what you know part, sometimes it can kind of jump to the forefront and it can make you go, oh, I'm, I'm going to be able to get this taken care of, no problem. You know, I have confidence in my abilities. And sometimes what happens is that I have confidence in my abilities thing, you kind of get in a little deeper because, a little deeper than you thought, because you have confidence in your abilities, but you've never done this thing before and this thing turns out to not be what you thought. <clears throat> because the, the landscape is always evolving. There's always gonna be new stuff to learn, changes in how the technology works, how it's assembled, you know, what goes with what, what's compatible, new generations of things come out. Asus decides to use fucking metal as a heat sink paste. You get the general idea here. So it, it's, everything's changing all of the time. There will always be a surprise around the corner somewhere. But it seems like these expensive computers are the ones that come with the most anti-repair surprises or, you know, it's always something dumb with the expensive ones for some reason. The more money you pay for a computer, the more likely it is some engineer made some smart design choice that is gonna turn out to either wreck the computer itself or make it really hard or impossible to repair it properly whenever it inevitably breaks. And you'd think if you paid a bunch of money for something that you'd be able to fix the damn thing when it breaks. What kind of idiot are you? Why, why do you expect that? That's just completely unrealistic. It, being able to fix something that breaks. Oh, yeah, no. That's crazy. Or at least that's what it seems like these engineers are saying to themselves. Yeah, you get real deep in one of these bad boys and you find something you didn't expect and next thing you know, it's just like, oh, oh, uh, there's metal everywhere, oops, or, oh, oh, it's like this thing's got stickers holding it in and these wires don't move and I'm not an elf, so my hands are the size of a small planet, I'm never going to get this fixed. But by then you've taken a deposit from the customer or the computer is currently in worse shape than it was whenever it came in. And you just worry. You worry. I just want everyone watching this to know you will never know everything. You will never see it all. Because even when you've seen it all, someone else invents a new thing to fuck your day up. Don't be afraid, but be careful. Especially, the most important part, know what you don't know. Think about how someone might screw you up even though you think you know what you're doing, even though you're confident in your ability, even though you have a huge skill set. <clears throat> you need to really think about what I mean, what they can do, what, what monkey wrench do they have in this machine? What kind of stupid surprise could they throw at me? Every time you stick a pry tool in something to break it in half, every time you go to replace thermal paste, every time any of this stuff happens, 
what can they fuck up? What can they do to make my day a lot worse? What can they what what could be underneath this that I may not be thinking about? Is there a wire? Is there a ribbon cable? Is there a tiny screw somewhere that I can't find? You know, is there something else holding it in that I'm gonna break if I pull too hard? Approach these things with care because the problem is that if you break someone's computer, you are somewhat likely, uh, I'll admit, not always, not everybody's going to assign blame to you or try to come after you for it, but you're pretty likely to get chased after by someone who wants their stuff in good working order or wants the money to replace it. And you're not in the business of giving people new computers for free. You're not in the business of giving people $1,700 so they can buy another gaming laptop. You're in the business of making money. You're in the business of fixing things so that they can go home happy with a working machine. And you can go home happy with their money in your pocket. Anything that gets in the way of that is not the way to go. It needs to be mutually beneficial. So, don't make mistakes, and you will make mistakes because that's how you learn, but if you're careful, and you think ahead, and you watch out, maybe you won't make as many mistakes as I've made in the past week and a half. Maybe you won't have the fear that I've had in the past week and a half. And maybe you won't suffer from all the cortisol pumping through your veins that I have in the past week and a half. And maybe you'll make some money instead of, uh, being on the hook for a $1,700 gaming laptop you don't want to buy someone. Well, that's it for this one. Take care. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next one. Turn off, you piece of shit.